Episode 5, Name Your Poison, is a humorous idiom asking what kind of alcoholic drink you would like. Some of the stories related here may seem humorous now in the 21st century, but during the Prohibition years in America and here in home in Somerset County, Pennsylvania, proved tragic to family life and values. Oh, hello. Welcome to Tales of the Alleghenies. I'm your host, Richard Sturtz. Come on, let's get started. The distilling of whiskey was going on in this area before Somerset County, Pennsylvania was officially formed in 1795. As settlers began clearing enough land to raise crops of grain, farmers were creating this beverage for cash. In the book, Whiskey Rebels, Leland Baldwin states that over 100,000 gallons of whiskey had been sent down the Ohio River from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in 1794. The whiskey was legal to make, but imposed federal excise tax was not being paid by the western counties of Pennsylvania, or what was known as the backwoods. President Washington led an army against the insurrectionists in 1794, disbanding the so-called rebels. By the way, President George Washington was the only seated president to lead and command an army into the field. World War I ended November 1918. With the terrible loss of life, struggles, and hardships, Americans were ready for change, and change it was. A new decade would dawn, 1920 bringing with it increased economic growth, prosperity, and social changes. The Roaring Twenties, the Jazz Age, a revolution in how men and women live their daily lives with household conveniences, stylish clothes, hairdos, and music that set the mood. Although not everyone was feeling this economic surge, some Somerset County farmers strapped with mortgages, striking and injured coal miners, and immigrants who have not gained a financial footing in America were struggling to survive. With all the advertised pleasures of foreboding evil or forbidden fruit as in the Garden of Eden, if you will, created an unquenchable thirst for alcohol. Segments of this episode are being filmed at the Wimber Hotel, located at 502 15th Street, Wimber, Pennsylvania. I'd like to thank Tom and Becky Pescatella, owners of the hotel, for allowing me to film here at this historic landmark. When it was built in 1897, it was known as the Leicester Hotel. Can you imagine? In Wimber's heyday, 11 hotels operated. Now only two remain. Prohibition, a term used long before the American Civil War by some dry or alcohol-free states of the Union. To make Prohibition a political issue, a Prohibition party was created way back in 1869. Organizations such as the Women's Christian Temperance Union and the Anti-Saloon League gained momentum during World War I due to the Food Control Bill that also prohibited the manufacturing of distilled liquor, beer, and wine. On July 1st, 1919, under the Wartime Act, no saloon in America could operate legally after that date. Legal or not, illicit saloons were in every town known as speakeasies. Speakeasies were established in hidden or locked back rooms, upstairs, or basements. You had to be recognized or give a password to gain entrance. 
Congress in 1917 created the 18th Amendment to the Constitution that would make the entire country dry, but did not go into effect until January 1920. It was defined and enforced by the Volstead Act. An intoxicating beverage was anything that had a content of one half of 1% alcohol per volume. Enforcement was by the Commissioner of Internal Revenue of the Treasury Department, and by 1930, responsibilities were transferred to the Department of Justice. Moonshining was a term that came from distilling whiskey under the cover of darkness or the shine of the moon, so the evaporating steam would not be detected. I'm at the Tall Pines Distillery in Salisbury, Pennsylvania, Somerset County, where I thought you might find it interesting to see how whiskey is made legally today. I believe then you will have a better understanding how bootleggers created what they called hooch, rot gut, fire water, white lightning, mountain dew, and their favorite term, moonshine. I'm in the Tall Pines Distillery with Keith Welsh, owner and operator of the distillery. Hi, Keith. Hi, Richard. Nice to meet Thanks you. Thanks for having us. Thanks for coming. So we have our own little secret amazing. area to okay. get into the distillery. And our shelf opens up into the door. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> wow. That is great. You can sort of smell the... Yeah, you can smell it. But we do eight different mash bills. Bills, whiskeys have to be strictly grain, no sugar at all. Moonshine can really be grain, sugar, anything you can derive sugar from. So you can use fruits, vegetables, anything like that in the grain. Typically, the majority corn on all of them, but we do have a rye whiskey that is all rye, straight rye. Um, we also have uh, a couple brandies that we do. Our Bananas Foster is 60 pounds of peeled bananas per 55 gallons of mash. So it's, Amazing. it's banana. That, that's it. So when you taste it, it's not the fake stuff. It's the real stuff. Our peach is two bushels of peaches per 55 gallon batch. It's really, uh, you know, you're seeing, you're, you're getting the natural flavors of it. Wine has been fermented and we distill that. So that's a black and blue. We make our own rum using blackstrap molasses and brown sugar. So yeah, we have, we have a wide variety, variety of stuff. So you can see some of the grains here. Our corn, uh, we use malted grains over here. We've got uh, some of our malted grains there too, um, and sugar. Um, you all see the barrels in here too. So we actually have, all of these are filled with uh, bourbon right now, aging. You are aging. Yeah. So once a barrel is used, that's it, or can it be reused? It's all you can use it for bourbon. Bourbon, the definition of bourbon is that it is strictly a grain whiskey, majority corn, and it can only be aged in a one-time used barrel, and that's it. That's finished. After that, we still can use the barrels, and you can get a good flavor out of it, but then it has to be called aged whiskey <laughs> by, by law. That's the way it is. And most of your um, Irish whiskey and scotch, is actually aged in used bourbon barrels. So it meets the specifications for that. But for bourbon, it's very strict of okay. meeting those specifications. That is an American thing. That's the American bourbon, and that's the way it is. Okay. So they're really, really strict about that. Because Moonshine is an unaged whiskey. Right. Um, can be flavored or whatever. Typically, it doesn't take long to manufacture. Now, some of ours, uh, we do have a pine sap. That's our signature drink. It's uh, cinnamon and vanilla. And that cinnamon vanilla does age. That's about a two-week aging process okay. that we do with that. So, but typically your moonshines are not long-term. Yeah. Okay. Right over here we have a a batch that we had just started. So we've got our corn barley and rye in here, and you can see what it's nice smell there. Nice and hot right now. Um, there's natural enzymes in the malted barley and malted rye that uh, will start to activate themselves. About 195 is the top that you want to go to heat them. And what that does, that softens the grains. It helps to start the enzymes to do their process. And actually fermenting will start on its own without adding yeast. 
And then after it cools down, then we'll add our yeast and then it'll really ferment. Okay. Typically, a batch this size is seven to 10 days. You'll get full fermentation. And how many gallons of liquid? This usable will be liquid. usable liquid. We'll end up with about 250 gallons. The grain then we put into uh, hoppers and we'll send it off to a local farm, a beef farm. Okay. So there is a bypass protein that is given off of distilled grains that will increase milk production in dairy animals up to 20%. Wow. It does have its advantages. Yeah, it's probably quite tasty to the livestock. Yeah, they like it. Yeah. You got to watch, make sure they're 21. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Once the mash, the mash is separated, we will have a pump. It will direct it through and transfer everything through an inch and a half stainless steel line that will go into the stills. <laughs> yep, so we'll head over here to the stills and take a look at that. So these are the stills. This is what we used, and it's running right now. You can see it's actually running in there. Uh, this is the one we used for two and a half years. That is only a 60-gallon. 60 60-gallon 60 still. And this will do 240. 200. Yeah. Now, these are stainless steel, or are they copper-lined? or S Stainless steel with copper domes. Okay. Yeah, and, copper domes and copper pipe. And why is that? Well, the copper actually... All the old distillers um, used copper as much as they could because it has a neutralizing effect on all of the, the contaminants and chemicals that are in mash that's produced through the heating. Okay. So it helps to neutralize that, helps to smooth out the moonshine. Okay. And it does have its advantages. So you're, on the far left is the still. That would be your pot or your still. The middle piece is a thumb keg. And the right piece on the far right is the condenser. Inside of that condenser is a coil of copper pipe. They would call that the worm. And the cold water would go into it. And then the alcohol would run through that copper pipe as it condensed, as it cooled down, then it would liquefy. Um, so your, your run has really four parts. Everybody says three parts, but they kind of combine the uh, forefronts with the heads. But the, four, the forefronts, those are... That's where you get your um, acetone. It smells like fingernail polish remover okay. in that. So we take that off and that's about a quart of real strong stuff that we have. And we'll use it to clean with or whatever. It's good for that. Um, but then the uh, when we once we take that off, then it's the heads. Still has a little bit of a funky smell and taste, but it could be 180 proof, 185 proof. Wow. Um, but we'll run that off and then we start our hearts. And so the hearts, when you do a run that ha that is heads and tails, it, it's usually a longer run. So this will take probably about 10 hours, but we will get a lot of product out of it. And it'll be product that will be four times distilled and will finish off at probably 160 proof. I wanted to ask you, um, what is the difference between moonshine, factor and prohibition, and the difference between it today? So the primary reason, the primary difference is taxes. Today, moonshine's legal, but then it was illegal. Moonshine became recognized as a spirit by the federal government in 2007. And when they did that, that made it that, you know, you could make moonshine based on moonshine recipes and, and call it a moonshine before that was just an illegal product. But some of the biggest things is that being legal now, we're required to meet certain health standards. Um, the old-time moonshiners, they'd be out in the woods. I mean, it wasn't necessarily the cleanest thing that they would do. Uh, the products that they had weren't always the best. I mean, you'll see in these new steels, these are 99.9% .9 pure red copper. Some of the other stuff that they had was not, but the copper itself wasn't the problem. It was the solder. Solder, solder was a lead solder. Lead. Okay. And so if they were uh, making their product, they had a lot of lead in it. And sometimes, in order to save money, they would use old radiators as condensers. Oh, my. Well, there's glycol in there. There's lead solder in there. And that's what they would use. And so that would make it very dangerous. And that, that was the problem. Uh, doing everything this way, it meets all the standards and specs. So, so that's when you see some people becoming blinded by alcohol and right. all kinds of other right. It was more because of the process that it was. It wasn't the, the liquid itself. It was just knowing what to do with it. Okay. Um, the first part of this, the run is the dangerous part, and that, that's what they need to watch. But some of these guys, they were all about making money, and they just mix everything together, and then okay. it would compromise it. You don't have far to the outhouse. 
So this is, uh, everybody says, what is that? I said, well, that's how it all starts. Okay. They hid their moonshine stuff in here. So this actually, that's still there, was one from uh, an Italian immigrant in Fayette County. And they would use that to make grappa. So he brought his wine with him. Of course, at that's that the time. Plum? Is that with the plum? No, that was, that was just wine. So that was, a, that was a grape. That would have been a, a brandy, uh, but they called grappa. This one down here, this steel, was from a Bulgarian immigrant that moved into Johnstown to work in the steel mills. Now, they were the ones that had the plum brandy. Bulgaria, Hungary, Poland, those countries had a lot of plums, so they made plum brandy, and that was called Slivovitz. And this is the steel he brought with him. And Copper is the star of the show. <laughs> so rum is not the same as moonshine. You're using molasses and brown sugar. Um, we have the white rum, aged rum, spiced, and a uh, coconut rum, toasted coconut rum. All of their flavors, every single one of them is natural. There are absolutely no artificial colors, flavors, say, or no anything color in any of them. Um, you'll see that in a lot of mainstream that they are. And they make some pink and yellow and red and blue, but that is not through distillation. That's fake flavors, artificial. So I wanted a very hot moonshine. I'm not talking hot alcohol. I was yeah. talking hot spice. Mm -hmm. So I had taken 10 different combinations of peppers and infused them into the moonshine. Um, we did ghost peppers. Ghost peppers don't have much of a flavor, but they're just hot. Mm -hmm. But I wanted flavor with it. So I ended up, this one is a Carolina Reaper, which is rated at a million and a half on the Scoville scale with Fresno chilies. So that gives you the flavor. Now I did this for um, our local fire company, station 618 in Salisbury. So I asked okay. them if they minded if we used that and they said no, because I'm donating $2 from every single bottle goes to oh, that. That's nice. So that's that has been, and we've written them a few thousand dollars in checks. People love it. Now I have had people come here that want to do that because they know it's for a good cause. But they'll taste it and they'll say, I can't do it. And they'll throw the two dollars on a table and say, just give it to them. <laughs> so I've done that. Well, Keith, thank you very much for showing us the Tall Pine Distillery. We sure. really learned a lot today. And uh, thanks for sharing your product with us. Well, thank you for coming. There are countless stories of moonshining in every town and township in Somerset County. Here are a few that you might find interesting. January 1922, Deputy Sheriff Menser and other law officers raided Owl's Roost, a small mining hamlet near Listenburg. They arrested two men and confiscated gallons of moonshine. They said it tested 150 proof, possessed a 40 mule kick, and was guaranteed to have 52 fighting devils to the pint. Saturday, August 5th, 1922. The Deal Band was performing at the Owl's Picnic Grove for the Order of Owl's annual picnic. I would say most of you never heard of the Order of Owls. I know I hadn't until I was researching this episode. Order of Owls was a secret fraternal order that was founded in 1904. Local orders were called nests. Back to the picnic. As the day wore on and evening came, music and moonshine mixed with the band. A free-for-all broke out on the platform. New green band coats were tossed in the air, chairs upturned, instruments kicked about, along with a course of cursing and swearing. The Myersdale Republican newspaper would report, hundreds of men, women, and children watching this disgraceful and shameful act of so-called gentlemen ruin their evening by the demon moonshine. Don't toot your horn when moonshine's involved. June 1922, eight members of the Wittenberg Coronet Band became belligerent by the results of unlimited quantities of moonshine. Disorder and fighting broke out at the Southampton Township Festival. According to witnesses, a near riot broke out. Squire Kendall and the Township Constable tried to restore order, but were compelled to retreat. Humans were not the only creatures to succumb to the mind-crippling effects of alcohol. 
Farmer Dickey drew attention to his milk cow and pasture, staggering about. Finally laying down on her back, she began kicking her legs like a baby and bawling. The next day, the cow recovered. Farmer Dickey found in his back pasture where someone had dumped a load of moonshine mash. I wonder when the farmer drank the milk, he became tipsy. Monday, October 17, 1922. Sheriff John W. Griffith and two other officers arrested Harry E. Smith, who lived along the Lincoln Highway, about two miles west of Stoystown. It was their biggest moonshine raid to date, confiscating 65 gallons of moonshine, 515 gallons of mash, and a 75-gallon steel. Harry Smith would be arrested three times for moonshining from 1922 to 1931, and would be reprimanded by Judge Norman Boos before sentencing. Not to be outdone, on April 23, 1923, state police and local officers captured a 200-gallon steel. It is said to be one of the largest ever seized in the state. The steel was located on a farm of Albert Beck, two miles from Bakersville. Authorities also confiscated 1,000 gallons of mash and 150 gallons of moonshine. It required six men to lift the 200 gallons still on a truck. October 26, 1922, the paper reports that the last 10 days law officers made 11 arrests, confiscated 24 stills and 192 gallons of moonshine that were brought to the county jail and 3,800 gallons of mash were destroyed. 17 of these stills came from the Central City area. September 18, 1924. A man and his wife pleads guilty of making moonshine near Wimber. The man lost both legs in a mining accident. They were making moonshine to support their family of five. Judge Berkey did not find them and said, go home and get out of the liquor business. There are many accounts of people with children being arrested. Some the husbands were sentenced to jail and the wife could remain home and support the children. And in other cases, children would be taken and put in a children's home. Some men were charged to do labor at the county home, which included a working farm and coal mine. December 17, 1925, two detectives pretending to be cattle buyers stopped the Living Good Farm in Upper Turkey Foot Township. The one detective, after a while, feigned sick and said to 18-year-old Harry Livingood, boy, a good slug of liquor would bring relief. Harry obliged him with some moonshine and in turn, the detective arrested him. I'm standing in the old Freedens Lutheran Cemetery. During the early prohibition years, this was a more secluded location. Route 281 did not run in front of the cemetery as it does today, but went past the front of the entrance to the Lutheran Church. Located here is a white bronze marker, and the only inscription on the marker is the name Harold, and no dates. Mark Ware, a Freedens resident and historian, did some research on this marker, which reveals a possible explanation for the ambiguous marker. The marker sits apart from any family plot, and cemetery records show no connection with the name at this location. Local legend lends the belief it was used as a designated drop for moonshine. Turning the monument over, you can see a gallon of moonshine fits perfectly beneath it. It's a great story, but the truth, I believe, is lost in time. In the 1920s, George Kimmel, a local Somerset County surveyor, was surveying land in the upper gorge of the Stony Creek River when he came upon a pipeline taking water from a spring down into the rhododendron. Exploring further, he found what he thought he would find, a moonshine still. The owner of the still was Harvey Sylvester Mossdollar, 
who owned a large tract of land adjacent to the spring. Here you can still see the pipes that are nearly 100 years old that fed the still. Harry Kimmel, also a surveyor and the son of George, showed me these pipes many years ago. Harvey was known to go to the Somerset County Courthouse and by way of the basement entrance, enter what was at that time the men's restroom. Here, men from the various row offices could sample his moonshine, place an order, and be picked up at a given location. As far as I know, Harvey was never arrested. How close to the noses of the law can you get? Harvey would also park his produce wagon here at the end of Refner Road and present day Route 281 north of Freedon, Pennsylvania. Beneath his cornucopia of produce lay a hidden supply of moonshine for knowing customers. What they called the noble experiment by removing alcohol from society would reduce crime and social problems. It only created more crime and a larger tax burden for government with increased law, enforcement, court, and prison costs. The, the stock market crash of 1929 and the Great Depression eyed a tax revenue to be gained and a creation of new jobs by legalizing alcohol. By December 1933, the 21st Amendment repealed the 18th Amendment, ending prohibition of alcohol in the United States although some states and local governments remain dry. In 1933, with the end of Prohibition nearing, Carlton France of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, purchased an old distillery located in Brothers Valley Township, Somerset County, Pennsylvania, located along Route 160 south of Berlin, Pennsylvania. I'm standing in front of one of a few remaining buildings of approximately 15 structures that once made up the France distillery complex. The distillery was the first to legally produce various kinds of whiskey since Prohibition in Somerset County. Since after the United States entered World War II, the France distillery was producing all of its alcohol for the government war needs. By the end of 1942, the distillery was producing 1,800 gallons of alcohol every 24 hours, seven days a week. The France Distillery was the largest distillery ever to be built in Somerset County. I barely scratched the surface on my coverage of Prohibition in Somerset County, Pennsylvania. As you can see, they were alluring, but yet provocative years of our history. I like a saying that was written in 1923 and may have been written by a florist. Say it with moonshine. The flowers will come later.